uh, oral questions, questions orales, the Honourable House Leader of the Official Opposition. Madame la Présidente, yes. Madam Speaker, yesterday the uh, Premiers um, met to, to agree on health funding. Now, what could have been an historic uh, meeting was unfortunately another demonstration of Liberal government arrogance. We'll deal with it later, said the Prime Minister. Oh, yes, as if we could trust him. As we've seen over the past few years, it's very we're it, it's a problem. Is the Liberal government, Madam Speaker, prepared to support a stable, predictable, and unconditional health care funding transfer? The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for the question. Governments at all levels are working together to keep Canadians safe from COVID-19. As part of our response to the pandemic, we announced $19 billion for a safe restart agreement to help provinces and territories restart their economies safely while we continue to respond to COVID-19. This funding is in addition to the $40 billion we already provide to provinces and territories each year through the Canada Health Transfer. Madam Speaker, we will keep working for the pro with the provinces and territories so we can fight COVID-19 together. Honourable Leader. The Honourable House Leader. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. The problem, Madam Speaker, is that the Premier said that this was a missed opportunity. Now, we had there was a unique opportunity to reach an agreement on health that transfers called for by all political parties in the provinces and territories for it to be stable, predictable, and unconditional, but uh, the uh, Prime Minister missed the boat. Why is he always prepared to tell the provinces what to do in health care but not commit to the funding? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you again, Madam Chair, and I thank the Honourable Member for the question. From day one, our government has been focused on supporting Canadians and jobs during this pandemic. We've provided more than eight out of every ten dollars spent to fight COVID-19. Our government's total support for provinces and territories during this pandemic includes $322 billion in direct measures to fight the virus and help Canadians. We will work with our partners to do whatever it takes for as long as it takes until we get through this pandemic. The Honourable Opposition House Leader. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Now, for the past three months, We've been dealing with the hybrid to Parliament, and we can say today that it's a success. It's working well. This was done with the agreement of all following an agreement, and the agreement uh, expires today. We uh, believe that uh, because uh, this was done with the support of everyone and because it worked, uh, the agreement should be extended exactly as it is until the 22nd of June, 23rd of June. Does the government agree with us? The Honourable Government House Leader. Madam Speaker, I agree with my colleague on the fact that we have worked together and collaborated. That is extremely important, important especially given the pandemic. We put forth a proposal to all of the parties. It's a motion, and it includes the voting application. And we can understand that because we look at how long it takes with Zoom. The motion that we distributed includes that, but the Conservatives seem to have a problem with the voting app, and I'd like to know why that is. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Liberals' delays in ratifying the Canada-UK trade agreement has caused UK trade officials to state, in their own words, this will cause damage and destruction on businesses on both sides of the Atlantic. This represents $29 billion a year in trade between our countries. Weeks ago at committee, the Minister would not commit to any timeline on legislation through Parliament or on the Senate. Canada's key business, agricultural and manufacturing organizations are calling on the Liberals to provide stability and predictability on trade with the UK. What is the plan? We're out of time. The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, now more than ever, our businesses and all Canadians are looking for stability and predictability, and our first priority is implementing the legislation. This is why we're looking forward to working with all parliamentarians on a timely passage of this important legislation. That being said, we're also actively working with the United Kingdom to ensure a smooth transition for businesses to prevent 
any disruptions. Thank you, Madam S Speaker. For Kelowna White Country. Well, Madam Speaker, the Liberals have had years to work on this trade agreement that they knew was expiring at the end of 2020. <clears throat> Instead, they pulled out of negotiations early in 2019, <clears throat> excuse me, and they didn't restart them until this summer. For weeks, the Minister has been talking about trade mitigation uh, ideas for businesses, and now the UK officials are saying that the Liberals' plans may not even be possible. The Minister left exporters out to dry with only 12 business days left for tariffs potentially being applied. And I've asked the Minister several times now, what is the plan to mitigate these disruptive tariffs? The Honourable Minister of Small Business and Exports. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Let me be clear. My, best, my message, our message to businesses, is that you don't have to prepare for a worst-case scenario. Why? because we do have a trade continuity agreement with the United Kingdom. And we are working hard to ensure that there are no disruptions and that there is a smooth transition. Nothing is more important to us than providing that stability and that predictability for Canadian exporters. We work for businesses. We will always work for businesses to ensure that they have this continuity. Thank you, Mrs. Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Manicouagan. Madam Speaker. A person could make a fortune compiling all of the nonsensical quotes by the Prime Minister, but yesterday he really outdid himself. Yesterday, all of the uh, Premiers, the Premier of Quebec and the others, called for increases to health transfers. And he told them, and I'm not making this up, the discussion was premature because of COVID. Madam Speaker, for the benefit of the Prime Minister and the Liberal Party of Canada, COVID is a health crisis. Healthcare workers are overwhelmed. There are 900 people in hospital because of this. There has never been in history a more opportune time to increase health transfers. What doesn't he understand? The Honorable Government House Leader. Madam Speaker, Quebecers are concerned for their mental health, their physical health. They're concerned about their loved ones. And that is our priority, to continue working with Quebec and the provinces to fight COVID. This is the greatest, most serious health crisis we've faced since the Spanish flu in the past century. We are working with the provinces. We are transferring money for PPE. We're working on vaccines. And the Bloc doesn't seem to want to, to uh, realize that. The Honourable Member for Manicouagan. Well, uh, Madam Speaker, the Prime Minister and the Government health Leader don't seem to understand. What we're asking for are increases to health transfers. Uh, this ask is coming from all of the Premiers and of the provinces. The Nas Quebec National Assembly, 81% of Quebecers and 73% of Canadians are calling for it. Just the, the Prime Minister and the Government house Leader don't seem to understand that. They're isolated. To, what they don't understand is we need to see investment in health care. We need to support uh, health care workers. 53 people died yesterday. What's it going to take for you to understand that? I'd like to remind the Honourable Member to uh, place her comments through the chair. The Honourable Government House Leader. This crisis, Madam Speaker, is serious. In Quebec, in the provinces, we have worked closely with the health care system. We've been transferring billions of dollars, and uh, generally, and for the pandemic as well. We have uh, invested money in PPE, in testing and tracing, in vaccines. That is our absolute priority. Instead of uh, being happy with that, they're looking to pick a fight, and they're looking to squabble. Our priority and is uh, keeping Canadians safe. That's the priority of Quebecers as well. Struggle. Billions of dollars of COVID funding has been spent by profitable corporations for dividend payments, executive bonuses, and stock buybacks. These companies don't have to pay back a cent. But it's a different story for regular Canadians who applied in good faith for emergency benefits, like artists and the self-employed. They're being told to pay back thousands of dollars. Once again, Liberals are putting big business profits ahead of everyday people. Will this government end the double standard? Will Liberals stop this vicious clawback from vulnerable, struggling Canadians? The Honourable Minister. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. And let me begin by wishing the honorable member and all members of this house a happy holiday season and a Merry Christmas. To address the question, our approach from day one has been to ensure that we provide enough support to Canadian households and businesses to keep them afloat so they can contribute to the economic rebound once this pandemic is over. With respect to the wage subsidy, I would point out that the only companies that are eligible for that are the ones who can demonstrate a serious drop in revenue that are using that money specifically to keep their workers on the payroll. I'm pleased to share with the Honourable Member almost 4 million Canadians still have a job as a result of that program. The Honourable Member for Hamilton Centre. At the start of this pandemic, the Prime Minister called on Canadian industry to step up and produce protective equipment. And step up they did. Distilleries and breweries across Canada scrambled to start producing much needed hand sanitizer. Their hard work and initiative saved lives. However, instead of buying hand sanitizer from these Canadian businesses, which produce thousands of liters, the Liberal government sent over a half billion dollars to multinational corporations. Can this minister explain the rationale? behind the decision to buy hand sanitizers from outside of Canada when small businesses in this country work so hard to start producing it. Thank you. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. So, so proud of the exceptional efforts by Canadian companies all across this, all across this great country to produce all of the materials that we needed to address this COVID crisis. Every single province, small businesses, large businesses, transformed businesses, they got us to where we need to go. And that's exactly what we invested in all along. Yes, there was equipment that couldn't be purchased here and there were purchases made out of the country. Everything was done absolutely properly and we have made sure that our manufacturing sector has been transformed as a result. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Selkirk Interlake Eastman. Madam Speaker, top secret government documents revealed the Liberals put pressure on our Canadian Armed Forces to train communist Chinese troops in Canada. Despite warnings from our Five Eye partners not to let China steal our military secrets, the Deputy Prime Minister was more concerned with her image in Beijing than Canada's national security. Kidnapping our citizens, bankrupting our farmers, violating human rights, cyber attacks, and spying. Which of these security threats is the Deputy Prime Minister willing to compromise by training Chinese troops? Whose side is she actually on? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety and, and Security. Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And let me, let me first of all say that the protection and safe return of the two Canadians currently detained by the Chinese government is our top priority, and we will continue to make that clear to China. Let me be also clear that we do not train with the Chinese military, and perhaps uh, the member opposite is confused by a cooperation plan initiative that he was a party to signing that was designed to guide the further development of bilateral defense relations with China that they signed, the Conservatives signed in 2013, Madam Speaker. But let me say once again, we do not train with the Chinese military. The Honourable Member for Selkirk Interlake Eastman. Well, Madam Speaker, we know that the Prime Minister expanded that agreement to her military training in 2017. And let's be clear, the invitation to the Chinese Army to come to Canada for winning winter training happened in February 2018 under this Liberal government. The hero in the story is the Chief of Defence Staff who stood up for Canadian values and axed this Liberal government's plan. He should have been able to count on the Minister of National Defence to have his back. Unfortunately, the Defence Minister hid under his desk and let the Deputy Prime Minister walk all over him. Why did the Defence Minister allow the Deputy Prime Minister dictate military policy with com Communist China that compromises our national security? Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And as is so often the case, the members got the story completely wrong. Um, and, and, in, and in fact, although there has been agreements put in place by the Conservatives since 2012 that were in, intended to develop strategic military to military talks, reciprocal government and uh, between reciprocal government and military officials, it, we have been very clear. Our relationship with China has continued to evolve, and we recognize the hostile activities of that particular government. Government, and let me be crystal clear, we do not train with the Chinese military. The Honourable Member for Perth Wellington. Madam Speaker, yesterday the Minister of Rural Economic uh, Development accused Conservatives of spreading misinformation, but here's some facts on rural broadband. Despite having half a million underserved residents in southern, southwestern Ontario, not a dime and not a single project was approved through the Connect to Innovate program for that area of the country. So Madam Speaker, very simply, to the Minister of Rural Economic Development, will she commit to regional funding through the Universal Broadband Fund for Southwestern Ontario for programs like SWIFT and for Eastern Ontario for programs like EORN? Here, 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 here. 
the Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, it's my pleasure to stand up in the House and talk about all the tools in our toolbox to connect Canadians and Canadians in New Brunswick. The new Universal Broadband Fund with the rapid response stream Applications are coming in daily. I encourage the member opposite to work with his local internet service providers and his communities to make sure that they put applications in that we can get all Canadians connected. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Our member for Perth Wellington. Well, Madam Speaker, unfortunately, the parliamentary secretary has left all the tools in the toolbox <laughs> because these projects are not going forward because of the lack of support from this Liberal government. Again, $186 million left on the table last year unspent by the Liberal government. Fewer than 9% of households connected. Fewer than 10% of Canadians connect, con uh, connected, despite what's been promised by these Liberal governments. Their service availability maps are completely flawed with errors. So, Madam Speaker, very simple to the minister why has she failed canadians in connecting rural canadians to high speed internet here, 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 here. the honorable parliamentary secretary madam speaker i was privileged and pleased to uh, be in an announcement this morning where we announced over 60 million dollars for rural southern ontario we are getting projects delivered but i need to remind all the members in this house please get your applications in the federal government depends on applications from communities and internet service providers to get canadians connected we will get all canadians connected and we are getting all canadians connected madam speaker Central Okanagan, Samilkami, Nicola. Madam Speaker, Canadian distillers quickly retooled and donated thousands of litres of hand sanitizer to fight COVID-19, yet this government bought $570 million of hand sanitizer from China. My private member's bill supports our distillers and their workers by allowing Canadians to ship their products through Canada Post. Will the Liberals support my bill that lets Canadians buy direct from Canadian producers, or will they side with the liquor monopolies that stop Canadians from getting the Canadian products that they want? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Our government worked hand in glove with Canadian industries all across the spectrum, whether it was ventilators, whether it was test kits, whether it was all different products that were necessary to tackle this crisis were worked with our industry. We transformed industry all across Canada and so many companies have contributed to this Made in Canada effort. We know how hard Canadians are working all together. This is just another great example. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member for Huron Bruce. Thanks, Madam Speaker. I'm pretty sure the government didn't transform the manufacturing industry in Canada, but we'll talk about that a different day. The Ag Minister continues to hammer farmers with the carbon tax, doesn't give the farmers any credit for any of the environmental work they do on farm. Environmental farm plan, planting cover crops, no-till drilling, manure management, taking marginal land out of production, managing on-farm water, and planting millions of trees. At the same time, she ignores the facts that crops and trees are natural carbon sequesters. When is she going to take this carbon tax off farmers? Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm very much aware of the price on pollution. We have analyzed it very carefully. That's why there are exemptions offered to our producers on fuel on farms, for greenhouses, for example. We're also working on several programs that are currently underway to help our producers to have access to better technology for sustainable agriculture. In the economic update, we announced $98 million for agricultural hub programs. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Madam Speaker, everyone was deeply disgusted two years ago when we saw a Donald Trump separating migrant children from their mothers at the U.S. border. That's why I'm shocked to see the same thing happening here in Canada. At least 182 children were separated from their families at the border this year. There's a, a cardinal principle here. We should, they shouldn't be separated. And the border services have been instructed not to separate families children from their families. What's happened and can the government ensure us that this will never happen again? Honourable Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I thank the member opposite for a very important question. And the welfare of, of children is a top priority in our asylum system. And as such, CBSA does not systemically or systematically separate children from their parents or legal guardians. I am pleased to advise the member in this House that there currently are zero children in immigration detention. And immigration detention is only used, Madam Speaker, as a measure of last resort. Alternatives for minors are all 
always considered first, which include the release into the care of parent, legal guardian, or placement with alternate arrangements, and only in such extraordinary circumstances um, is, is a child allowed to, to remain in detention with a parent, but those circumstances are, are strictly limited by ministerial directive, and I'll, I'll repeat again, currently there are zero children in detention. The Honourable Member for St. No the Honourable Member for St. Jean. Madam Speaker, I said at least 182 children have been separated from their families. But the truth is we don't know how many there are because the government doesn't keep statistics on that. 182 children, that's the number of families who uh, contacted Action Refugié Montreal for help. We have no idea how many more there are. Has the minister launched an investigation to track every child who's ever been separated from his or her family? And if not, what is he waiting for? Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And, 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 I'll, and I, again, I'll, I appreciate the, very much the, the member opposite's question, but clearly she wrote the question before she heard my answer. And, and so I will repeat for her, as I've already said twice, there are currently zero children in immigration detention. We track it very carefully. An a, a, a direction has been clearly given to CBSA, and CBSA will only use immigration det detention as a last resort in exceptional circumstances. Those circumstances have led to a significant reduction. The actual number of children in detention peaked in 2014. We've worked tirelessly to reduce that number, and today it's zero. The, the Honourable Member for Bull River. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Canadian ag producers have worked hard this year to keep food on our plates during an unprecedented crisis. They're at the top of Santa's good list this year. I think they deserve some long-awaited gifts, like broader trade access, an exemption from carbon tax, BRM reform, and fair hearing for neonix insecticides. Will this government deliver, or can farmers and ranchers expect another lump of coal from the Liberal government? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I was very uh, proud a couple of weeks ago to uh, put a clear offer on the table to my counterparts from the provinces to improve agri-stability by 50%. The government of Canada is ready to remove the, refer the limit on the, the margin re reference margin limit uh, on this agri stability program, and also to increase the compensation rate from 70 to 80 percent. And I'm waiting for the response from my counterpart in the provinces. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The honourable member for uh, Regina Louvain. Jobs, Madam Speaker. That's what people in Western Canada want, jobs. And that's what this Prime Minister promised the USW 5890 workers we needed a photo op with them last year. He'd protect their jobs. So without the Care Bear stare, without mentioning what Mr. Harper did or didn't do, there's one simple question that oil and gas workers want to know the answer to across this country. In this Prime Minister's reimagined economy. Is there a room for them to raise their family, support their family, and put food on the table? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, TMX, we got it approved, 7,000 jobs created so far. Line 3 pipeline, we approved it, 7,000 jobs created. Keystone Excel, we're supporting it. On the Canadian side, 1,500 jobs created. NGTL 2021, we have approved it. Thousands of jobs to be created. LNG Canada, building at thousands of jobs there. Orphan and inactive wells, $1.7 billion. Thousands of jobs in Alberta and Saskatchewan. And wage subsidy, more than 500,000 workers kept in their jobs in a pandemic in Alberta alone. That is our record. We will keep working to make sure that people are working in Western Canada. Thank you, Madam Chief. The RO member for Mission, Matsky Fraser Canyon. Madam Speaker, Parliament rises today, but small municipalities and non-for-profits will work through Christmas trying to meet the December 31st deadline for rapid housing funds. Big cities, however, can simply collect their promised checks, one set of rules. I know for a fact small communities are still trying to make sense of the fund, never mind be in a position to submit an application. Second set of rules. Why is this government excluding them from having a reasonable shot at reaching and helping their homelessness issue before Christmas? Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister. 
Madam Speaker, our government is committed to ending chronic homeless homelessness everywhere, right across Canada. The one billion dollar rapid housing initiative it targets where the, the situation is most severe and where COVID is strongest and where public health dictates we invest quickly. All municipalities, all communities, Indigenous-led governments as well can apply for the rapid housing initiative. We're committed to ending homelessness. This is the first installment, and we are working just as hard over Christmas to make sure every community, small ones, large ones, regional ones, northern ones, get the support they need to help vulnerable Canadians in difficult situations. Thank you. The R member for Saskatoon Grasswood. Madam Speaker, Canadian ownership and control of our radio and television broadcasters is crucial to ensuring the continued support of Canadian content and cultural programming. But the Liberals have decided to open the floodgates to foreign outlets by removing the long-standing legislated requirement that radio and television broadcasters shall be effectively owned and controlled by Canadians. Why is the government throwing Canadian ownership requirements into the wind? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, I think most members in this place agree we need to modernize our broadcasting act to make sure that the web giants pay their fair share. Our broadcasting system predates the digital era and unduly disadvantages Canadian broadcasters. That is why we introduced legislation that will ensure online broadcasters contribute their fair share to support Canadian music and Canadian stories. A modernized bill will also mean more creative opportunities for Canadians and by Canadians. We're ready to work with our colleagues and opposition parties to protect our culture and promote Canadian workers and creators. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Victoria. Madam Speaker, the Liberals have missed every single climate target. They haven't planted a single one of their promised two billion trees, and they're spending billions of dollars on a pipeline that contradicts their own climate plans. We are in a climate crisis. Along with ambitious targets, we need action. Cities like Montreal are showing real leadership with bold, concrete plans, but the Liberals just keep rehashing versions of old plans with excuses about why they haven't gotten around to them yet. When will this Prime Minister, stop re-announcing things and start actually doing them. Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And perhaps my honourable colleague is unaware, so I'll remind her, we are the first government to put in place a 50-point plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We are the first government to put a price on carbon pollution. We are the first government to invest in planting 2 billion trees. We are the first government to invest in zero-emission vehicles. We are the first government to invest historic amounts in green infrastructure, Madam Speaker. And we're not done yet. Very shortly, we will be announcing our plan to show how we're not going to achieve our Paris targets but surpass them, Madam Speaker. We're going to do it for our kids. We're going to do it for our grandkids. The Honourable Member for Rosemont, La Petite Patrie. Yesterday, the Liberal government slapped Quebec and the provinces in the face. If there's one thing that this pandemic has taught us, it's that our health care system is fragile. There's a lack of resources and working conditions are difficult. This is the direct result of cuts to health transfers started by the Conservative Conservatives and continued by the Liberals. This creates terrible pressure on the provinces and it's untenable. Why don't the Liberals understand that Quebec and the provinces need sustainable increases in health transfers, not just this year, but permanently? The Honourable Government House Leader. Madam Speaker, we're working hand in hand with the provinces in terms of transferring millions of health care dollars. Because of the pandemic we're in right now, we've transferred considerable amounts for equipment and for many measures and also for vaccines that are coming. Of course, we're going to continue with discuss with Quebec and the provinces uh, increases, but right now we're focusing on the worst health care crisis since the Spanish flu. We're here for Quebecers and we're going to continue to be there for them. Member for Cape Britain Council. Madam Speaker, the J.A. Douglas McCurdy Airport in Cape Breton is a critical and essential piece of infrastructure that supports communities in my riding and surrounding areas. This week, Air Canada announced the suspension of the remaining services to and from my airport, resulting in no commercial flights available for my constituents, jobs lost, and an uncertainty for the future of our airport. Could the Parliamentary Secretary please tell this House and Canadians and people in Cape Breton Canso what our government is doing to support regional airports like my airport in Cape Breton Canso? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. 
I'd like to thank the honourable member, who is a tireless advocate for Cape Breton. We're disappointed by Air Canada's decision to cancel more regional routes. We know how regional airports are important for communities in Cape Breton and across the country. Over the next few years, the government will invest more than $1.1 billion to support key players such as airport authorities and regional airlines. Any further discussions about taxpayer support for ma major airlines will prioritize retaining and reinstating regional routes uh, that connect our communities, just like Sydney. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Manning. Madam Speaker, they say history repeats itself from time to time, with this government seem to happen too often. We are dealing yet with another 11th hour trade deal with the United Kingdom, our closest ally. With only one day left in this parliamentary calendar, how can this government expect the deal to be subject to total scrutiny in Parliament before the December 31st deadline, and how much will this incompetence cost Canadian taxpayers in mitigation measures? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for that question, and I know that all of us uh, on all sides of the House care about our exporters who are exporting to the United Kingdom. I'm very pleased that we have a uh, trade agreement with the United Kingdom that, uh, that will preserve the uh, the the terms of CETA, a high standard agreement that protects the environment. It removes 98% of tariffs for Canadian exporters. It completely protects our supply managed sectors. This is a good agreement and we are going to work with Canadian exporters to make sure that they uh, experience a smooth transition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member of Calgary Shepherd. Madam Speaker, industrial processed products in my riding makes wire mesh pads for the energy sector. Their high quality wire is manufactured in Asia before being upgraded in Calgary. Now a CITT tribunal ruling is forcing them to purchase inferior wire from their multinational competitor 10 times their size or face crippling tariffs for importing raw materials. Local manufacturing jobs are at stake. Why is the Liberal government allowing big business to take out their local competition using government rules? The Honourable Minister. We are, uh, of course, Madam Speaker, committed to not only uh, full value in pro uh, procurements in Canada, but also, and of course, respecting uh, the trade de deals that we have honoured. I'd be happy to inform myself of uh, the circumstances uh, that the Honourable Member replies to and get back to him. The Honourable Member for Edmonton agrees back. Madam Speaker, the busiest duty at my office is helping people with immigration issues, but there's a problem. Civil servants tell me that cases people filed online are being processed as usual, but cases where people filled out paper applications, most immigration files, are hardly moving at all. We're told it's because civil servants working at home don't have access to all those paper files. This is unfair people, to people eager to start a new life in Canada. Will the immigration minister fix this problem immediately? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Sure, it's been a challenging time for loved ones, but we have reunited tens of thousands of families notwithstanding the pandemic. This progress is the function of a carefully executed plan that has added resources to the border, introduced effective health protocols, and created new pathways for unification. When it comes to our service standards, not only are we keeping our 14-day turnaround on complete applications, we're exceeding it. Madam Speaker, it would be inappropriate to comment on any individual case. I'd be happy to work with the Honourable Member, but I can assure members of this House that we are doing everything that we can to reunite as many families as possible while protecting the health and safety of Canadians. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Montmagny, Lislette Kamouraska. Madam Speaker, I asked the Minister of Immigration last month about unacceptable delays in the processing of the files of workers already in Canada, of spousal sponsorships and of other foreign workers who are still waiting so much so that jobs here have been outsourced elsewhere. The minister talked about boosting capacity to pro process 6,000 cases a month. Can he tell us um, how many applications, uh, rather how many companies will have access to foreign workers in 2021? Like I said earlier, Madam Speaker, we took action quickly to establish uh, reunification process for several families, and many of them uh, are still in our system. I'm 
proud to announce new measures to accelerate the processing of files, and this will continue to reduce delays and roughly, roughly there will be 49,000 decisions by the end of the year. The Honourable Member for Abitabi. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to give you a clear example of the weight of Quebec in the Liberal Party. Ottawa withdrew an icebreaker contract from C-SPAN in Vancouver because it was unable to build it, because it just didn't have the production capacity. I have nothing against BC, but they weren't ready. So Davey offered to take over the contract and build the icebreaker immediately. Not only did Liberals not transfer the contract to Davey, but they in are investing an extra $1 billion to boost production capacity at the other shipyard. They're prepared to pay $1 billion more so that the Quebec does not get the contract. How can the Quebec Liberals accept this? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Davy is obviously a key partner for the Government of Canada already. There was a frigate uh, that was already ordered. We're already looking at a second interim icebreaker thanks to workers at the Davy shipyard. And we're also considering uh, a th including it in, as a third shipyard in our national strategy. But the Conservatives ignored this and didn't do anything when they were in power. But, Madam Speaker, we're going to continue to work with the Davy Shipyard. The Honourable Member for ABTB. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That's not enough, obviously. The federal government has an icebreaker to build. It has a choice between a construction site in Vancouver, from which it had to withdraw their contract because it wasn't able to build it, and on the other hand, the Davy Shipyard in Levy in Quebec, which is ready to get started tomorrow. And the choice of the Liberals is to give a billion dollars more to the Vancouver site so it ends up being behind schedule and with extra costs. It can't even do what Davy can do right now. It's both a bad policy and a waste of public funds and an insult to Quebec. Madam Speaker, will the Liberals stand up? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. The Liberals of Quebec, Madam Speaker, are working hard for Quebec workers, and that's why we're in trying to include Davy in our national shipbuilding strategy, which will include new contracts in addition to the contracts that have already been awarded to Davy. We're looking at $1.1 billion already awarded to Davy, and we're going to continue to work with that shipyard. And we didn't listen to the facts of the block that were misleading. We did not give in the, the contract to Vancouver. On March 23rd, the Prime Minister announced with much fanfare that Canada would be producing its own vaccine at Vito V. Intervac in Saskatoon. Vito Intervac has since presented to the Clerk of the Privy Council a plan to manufacture not only their vaccine, but all vaccines licensed by Health Canada. Vito has heard nothing but crickets, while large multinational companies get billions. Madam Speaker, has the Prime Minister abandoned the idea of manufacturing vaccines in Canada? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Our government has been led by scientists and the best expert advice that we can get from the Vaccine Task Force at every single step during this COVID crisis. And Vito Intervac has been a key part of that. There have been many other Canadian companies and Canadian research out enterprises that have been doing that exact work. Uh, 170 million in the National Research Council, uh, $46 million for Vito Intervac. The investments are going to continue and we're always going to make decisions on the basis of expert scientific advice. It's not going to be partisan and it's unfortunate that the member opposite is politicizing this. The Honourable Member for Langley Aldergrove. Madam Speaker, uh, amid the COVID crisis, Canada is facing another uh, health crisis, opioid overdoses. Uh, there are over 100 illicit drug toxicity deaths in British Columbia every month, and that number has been going up due to the COVID pandemic. These are ordinary Canadians, hardworking people, moms, dads, brothers, sisters, everyone with a heartbreaking story to tell. There's no vaccine for addiction, but why is this government failing to take any effective action to curb this crisis? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, I want to thank the member for the very important question. The opioid crisis is the most significant public health issue in Canada's recent history, and our hearts are with those 
who've lost a loved one. We have responded. We have actioned. Investing over $425 million in emergency responses, restoring harm reduction and improving over 40 supervised consumption sites, and cutting red tape and removing barriers to treatment. We will continue to tackle this epidemic by expanding access to safe supply of prescription opioids, committing over $700 million towards treatment in the next decade. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Port Neuf, Jacques Cartier. Madam Speaker, a woman in my riding who has met all the criteria and deadlines has seen her request for an extra $200 in guaranteed income supplement denied. Her September 11th was a deadline set by the government, yet Service Canada recognized that it received all of her documents on August 12th. Madam Speaker, I'm asking the minister to pay all seniors who are victims of this system to to pay them their GIS. Our seniors deserve better treatment. The Honourable Minister. Uh, opposite for raising this very important question. Guaranteed income supplement payments we know are critical for seniors. Uh, we know that it's important uh, that everybody that should have got the payment uh, was able to get it. And that is why we were managing this very carefully, making sure that those that could get it and, and may not have gotten it were, were assessed and evaluated and got it. However, there were some of those that missed the deadline for being able to get it, and we are very, um, it's unfortunate. But maybe the uh, member could please bring this specific case to, my, to our office and we'll make sure. The Honourable Member for St. Leonard Saint Michel. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I was very excited to see the promise in the speech from the throne for a pan Canadian early learning and child care system. Parents have been asking for affordable and accessible child care for decades now. My constituents were also impressed by the... I would like to order. I'd like to ask Mr. Godin to close his mic, please. Uh, the Honourable Member... Je, je, I will ask the Honourable Member for St. Leonard, St. Michel, to start her question again. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As I was saying, I was very excited about the promise in the speech from the throne for a pan-Canadian child care system. Parents have been asking for affordable and accessible child care for decades now. My constituents were also impressed by the investments outlined in the fall economic statement. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development tell this House the next steps for this important program? Thank you. The Honourable Minister. Much for that that question. I, it's, I'm sure she, the members as proud as I am to be part of a government that's advanced 420 million dollars for staffing and training for early learning and childcare in the next year. It builds on close to a billion dollars, an historic amount of money invested in the childcare and learning system this year, which builds on a 7.5 billion dollar investment and accords with provinces and territories as we move towards a national system. Now. You know, I was here in 2005 and watched an NDP uh, party uh, keep families locked in a house as they gambled for seats in this house. I hope this time around the NDP doesn't pay those childish games, but it will have to wait for the leader to get off TikTok and stop playing video games before we actually find out. The Honourable Member for Dauphin, Swan River, Nipawa. Madam Speaker, the Minister of Public Safety continues to brag about taking away firearms from law-abiding fire. He has stated that the firearms he banned have no place in a civil society. With all due respect, Madam Speaker, gangs, criminals, and violence have no place in a civil society. Can the minister inform Canadians how many criminals will be impacted by his firearms ban? Our Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness. Thank you, very, Madam Speaker. And I'm always happy to, to answer questions from the gun lobby and to respond to <laughs> NRA talking points. But, Madam Speaker, there are weapons that were designed for the sole purpose of killing people. And we have now prohibited those weapons in Canada. Um, it, it is only one of many measures that we'll be implementing to strengthen gun control, to invest in law enforcement, and invest in our kids and our communities to keep them safe. Madam Speaker, there is no greater responsibility for any government than the the protection and safety of their citizens, and we will do everything necessary to keep them safe. The Honourable Member for Calgary Skyview. 
Madam Speaker, while the airline industry lobbies the government for a taxpayer-funded bailout, this very same industry is forcefully demanding that travel agents, 82% of whom are women, return over $200 million in commissions that they made from the sale of airfares and vacation packages. Madam Speaker, while the airline industry has turned their backs on these women, this Liberal government should not. Will the Minister for Women and Gender Equality do her job and stand up for the women of this country? The Honourable Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I've also heard from the industry and, and share the members' concern. Um, we know the airline sector needs support, um, but I, I want to assure the member that before we do, we will not spend one penny of taxpayer dollars uh, on airlines until Canadians get their refunds, until regional communities retain their air connections uh, to the rest of Canada, and Canadian air carriers maintain their status as key customers of Canada's aerospace industry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Edmonton with Askowin. Madam Speaker, my uh, gift to this government is a very easy question that they know is coming because I asked it just a couple of weeks ago. It's a yes or no question, but when I asked it a couple of weeks ago, I got an incomprehensible list of numbers and words unrelated to the question. Is it, um, it can this government commit that the tens of millions of barrels of oil coming from Saudi Arabia, Algeria, and Nigeria? will be subject to the same rigorous regulations as oil coming from Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Newfoundland in terms of upstream and downstream emissions. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And certainly we are committed to making sure that we have the cleanest oil in the world being produced in Canada and being exported from Canada. That's why we, that's why we have supported the TBIX pipeline. We are supported the workers that are creating that pipeline, as well as Line 3, Line 5, LNG. So we are supporting Western Canada, Western jobs, and continuing to, to make sure that uh, we have the highest standards so that when we export, we make sure that we have the highest standards in the world. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kitchener Conestoga. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, investing in nature is an essential tool that the government can take to, uh, to, to combat climate change. Canada's grasslands, wetlands, and peatlands are incredibly important for their ability to absorb greenhouse gases. Could the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change explain how the $631 million investment in the fall economic statement will help conserve our nature? Thank you, Madam. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I'd like to thank the Member of Parliament for Kitchener-Conestoga for his important question and deep commitment to taking action on climate change. Our government recognizes the important role of nature in addressing climate change, and our significant new investment of $631 million will help our government put in place natural solutions that reduce greenhouse gas emissions associated with the loss of ecosystems. This is good news for our environment, Madam Speaker, good news for biodiversity, Madam Speaker, and of course, Good news for future generations of Canadians. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Vancouver, Kingsway. Madam Speaker, Vancouver has seen 329 overdose deaths so far this year, making 2020 the worst year on record. And to address this escalating crisis, City Council voted unanimously to decriminalize personal possession of substances. Premier Horgan, the Vancouver Police, Dr. Bonnie Henry, and many other experts agree that this will save lives and improve public health. The federal Liberals rightly listen to public health experts about COVID-19. Will they do the same here and swiftly grant the requested exemption to the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act? The Honourable Minister. Uh, thank you very, very much, Madam Speaker. And I want to thank the Honourable Member for the uh, very important question. The COVID-19 pandemic has worsened on the ongoing opioid crisis. All levels of government must reaffirm our efforts to save the lives of Canadians. We are working with BC and with Mayor Stewart on options that respond to their local and regional needs, guided by the recommendations of the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police and the Public Prosecution Service of Canada. We will review this request. We will continue our work to get Canadians who use substances the support they need. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Thank you, Madam Speaker. During this pandemic, some private long-term care home operators used government assistance money to pay millions to shareholders and CEOs. 
and some corporations used wage subsidy programs to pay employees while their wealthy owners raked in billions. But this holiday season, the CRA is going after low-income, self-employed Canadians for taking the CERB based on unclear rules. Will the government stop taking the conservative approach of punishing the poor while giving the wealthy who game the system a free pass? The Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Speaker, our focus since day one has been on supporting Canadians through this crisis. And when Canadians needed support the most, the Canada Emergency Response Benefit was there to help nearly 9 million Canadians pay their bills and be there for their families. In some cases, Canadians applied to the CERB in good faith but were not eligible. In those situations, we recognize the financial situation that many people are facing. And that is why the CRA has reached out and will make every effort to work together with Canadians to find a responsible way forward that is responsive to individual needs and circumstances.